गुड इवनिंग लॉन्ग बैक हेलो सुधांशु चिन्ह पार नमस्कार Yeah, we we all always take out this type of peculiar uh, things, you know. We have all these lines of like this. <laughs> so, doctor, also you give me the countdown, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> Recording in progress. You can continue and start, sir. Please start. Yes. So this is our uh, second I webinar. This is our second webinar of uh, OJOT in this season, and uh, this will be on the topic of uh, charcoal food. And so, for in the in this is what better way but uh, to have a collaboration between the state chapter of our Odisha Orthopedic Association and the state chapter of Associations of Surgeons of India. So we decided on this collaboration, and I would request Dr. N. C. Mahapatra and Dr. and kailash mahapatra to kindly uh, give a brief introduction about our speakers our moder our and our panel members and then we can proceed uh, i request uh, uh, professor kailash mahapatra to start the introduction and introduce our speakers then only i'll go on thank Kailash, you sir. very much uh, uh, nirmal saswat it's a great pleasure and delight to be here today in this uh, uh, event uh, This session, jointly organized by the Association of uh, Orthopedics Association of Odisha and Association of Surgeons of India Odisha State Chapter, with uh, the Orthopedics uh, Journal and Trauma, uh, the members of that uh, committee also. It's a unique opportunity, and uh, I think we'll, all of us will be greatly benefited. Uh, uh, we have picked up a very nice subject, uh, the charcoal foot reconstruction, and in this forum. uh we have uh, two uh, overseas speakers who are international authorities on the subject they are extremely renowned and famed and uh, acclaimed as uh, the pioneers in reconstructive surgery uh, in diabetic charcoal food all over the world at the outset i welcome everybody on behalf of my co moderator dr nirmal and very good uh, evening to all of you and uh, to overseas uh, faculties a good afternoon very good afternoon and uh, besides that we have uh, very renowned panelists uh, uh, professor banavihari misra head of the department of surgery ac medical college professor avanikant misra head of the department of orthopedics mks medical college and professor s r patnaik professor and hod endocrinology and mks medical college so we have a galaxy of uh, faculties speakers and uh, uh, panel members who are going to give us a very good academic feast today evening and uh, and we are discussing about a very common problem which is uh, all confronted by all of us in day to day practice that is diabetic foot and problems of diabetic foot as you all know are enormous and uh, this uh, also perturbs us all in clinical practice as we face these problems uh, in the, uh, every day and uh, not only that the diabetic foot complications like uh, a neuropathic infected foot uh, a vascular foot uh, uh, gangrene and ischemia are uh, preponderant and the chalk of foot are all mm -hmm. challenging for management and it is uh, a very pertinent at this uh, time for all of us this uh, this surgeons of odisha and the surgeons and orthopedics uh, uh, friends of odisha have joined uh, together to collaborate uh, on on this platform a very very interesting uh, uh, you know topic uh, of managing this uh, 
a very precarious complications of diabetes. As you know, the incidence of charcoal food has been increasing, which was a rare disease, because, but now it has been increasing in uh, incidence and uh, is posing a huge problem uh, so far as the diagnosis is concerned as well as the management is concerned. Many times it is missed or uh, a misdiagnosis. And uh, besides that also, there there is always a lack of, uh, you know, uh, understanding this problem amongst the clinicians, surgeons, orthopedicians, or general physicians, whosoever encounter this problem, because in our part of the country, there is filarial uh, lymphangitis, cellulitis, osteomyelitis. Or these are the common problems which we encounter, and sometimes they, they are misdiagnosed, uh, and uh, if uh, these cases get neglected, and they land up with uh, deformed, unstable foot, uh, uh, and finally gets ulcerated, infected, sepsis, supervents, and uh, and we lose many limbs like this. So to uh, have a very clear understanding, we have, uh, uh, I just, will, uh, we have planned like this. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll just share my screen, a few slides, which are the over. <laughs> <clears throat> My slides are visible? Yes, visible. Okay. So, charcoal, neuro, charcoal neuropathic osteoarthropathy, uh, charcoal foot is a severe foot complication of diabetes in which there is considerable bone and joint destruction. And it was first described by John Martin. And then it was established uh, by Jordan that diabetes also causes this same problem. It is also seen in other conditions like alcoholic neuropathy, seringomyelia, spina bifida, leprosy, congenital sensory neuropathy, familial amyloid neuropathy, and HIV-induced neuropathy also. Charcot neuropathy is expected to rise as there is a global recognition of this condition. And uh, there is also global increase in the prevalence of diabetes, uh, which, uh, which is definitely contributing to increased number of charcot neuropathy. A unilateral heart swollen red foot in a diabetic patient is diagnosed as charcoal foot unless proved otherwise. Exact mechanism of this condition is unclear. There are two theories which are proposed, like neurotraumatic and neurovascular. But there is a pro-inflammatory condition which exists, and there is localized inflammation, and the inflammatory markers are increased, like IL-1, IL-6, TNL-alpha, and there is overexpression of rank L. This overactivity leads to increased osteolytic activity, leading to bone resorption, bone destruction, and fragmentation, and joint dislocation. The classifications are uh, the most uh, earliest is Eichenholz classification, and there is uh, modification by Brodsky, and uh, we uh, and the recent classification of Sanders and Freeport. There are four stages in Eichenholz classification. Stage zero is prodromal followed by fragmentation, coalescence, and the remodeling and reconstruction. St in stage zero, there are signs of inflammation like red, heart, swollen foot. It, it is at this stage that the diagnosis is mostly missed and uh, there are some conditions which mimic, as I said, and very common in our uh, part of the world is filaria, which is very common and we miss them as thinking as cellulitis. Sometimes it is also missed as osteomyelitis some arthritic conditions like gouty arthritis and uh, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis like this. Also, we miss you. Management uh, will be discussed. Uh, today, we'll be discussing about surgical reconstruction. And uh, stage zero disease is the conservative management. But as the uh, stage advances to stage one, stage two, stage three, surgical management has become the gold standard, uh, the, uh, has been carried out in many centers in the world. And... Uh, Nowadays, under the multidisciplinary food centers uh, being uh, promulgated uh, by uh, various uh, societies, and uh, so the patients are get benefited. Uh, and uh, this uh, sophisticated surgical uh, procedures with, uh, with uh, highly technological uh, instrumentation, we are able to achieve a stable uh, and uh, a plantigrade foot by which the 
uh, patient can have a normal life at least with restricted mobility. Thank you very much, friends. Now uh, we'll move on to our guest faculties uh, who will be uh, uh, firstly, I'll uh, call upon and invite uh, uh, Professor Venu, uh, our overseas speaker from UK. Professor Venu is uh, uh, the son of the soil and from Hyderabad. We are very proud of you, Professor Venu. You have uh, acclaimed so much of uh, international fame in diabetic foot reconstruction. You are working as a consultant orthopedic surgeon at King's College Hospital London. You are also honorary senior lecturer of King's College London, associate professor Odense University Hospital and the University of Southern Denmark. You are a member of the Education Committee of British Orthopedics Foot and Ankle Society. And uh, most importantly, and the recent one, is the president of the International Association of Diabetic Foot Surgeons. So he is uh, controlling the entire globe so far as our foot management is concerned. Thank you, Professor Venu, for giving your time and valuable uh, inputs. And uh, we'll be, we are eagerly waiting for your uh, uh, deliverations. Now over to you, Professor Venu. You can share. Thank you very much, Professor Kailash. Please uh, share, you. sir. Please let us... Uh, why don't you introduce uh, Dr. Madhu also so that um, before we introduce the faculty, then he can start his lecture. Okay. We, we have also with us uh, Professor Madhu. And uh, he's also the son of the soil and we are proud of you, Professor Madhu. Professor Madhu is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at uh, Mid and South Essex University Hospital, Basildon, UK. He has special interest in foot and ankle surgery, particularly diabetic foot reconstruction and pediatric orthopedics and trauma orthopedics. So, Professor Madhu, we are also having you and we are very eager to listen to you today also. Thank you very much. Sir, um, before I introduce my other panel members, I can say, Dr. Beno and Madhu, they are known to us for last maybe a decade and they have visited our institution also and uh, deliberated with our postgraduates. Uh, they are fantastic academicians. So we feel, uh, we think uh, today's seminar will be fruitful. Now let me introduce our other faculties. Um, we have our uh, few panelists, Professor Abhanikand Misro, um, he is uh, one of the senior post professors in Orisha. Uh, he is now currently a professor and HOD department of orthopedics, MKCG Medical College, Barampur. And our next panelist is Professor S.R. Patnay. He is the professor HOD of endocrinology, interest uh, in this diabetic food management also. He is the president of Odisha Endocrine Society. And we have also Professor uh, Dr. Banabihari Misra. Uh, he's the professor and head of the Department of Surgery now in SC Medical College, Qatar. And he has a long uh, uh, experience in as professor and as academician. And he has many achievements to uh, his uh, ESO, but to, will not continue all those things. And uh, because it will take time, we have a few other uh, very important uh, personality, Dr. Samsal Hoda and Dr. Ashok Sam. They are the new generation IT specialist of uh, Indian Orthopedic Association, and they have revolutionized these uh, webinars and uh, non-virtual teaching programs in India by Ortho TV and IO TV. So, welcome you all. Um, no. Now, we uh, said before uh, requesting Madhu to start his uh, lecture. I also. Uh, Welcome the President and Secretary of Odisha Orthopedic Association and Dr. Professor Basant Kumar Mehra and Dr. Adike Samantara and also uh, Secretary of ASI Odisha, uh, Dr. Sudhanshu Shekhar Sutar and their Chairman, Dr. Vikas Pota and also Sirsendu and uh, uh, Saswat, all of them. Uh, I think that's enough for introduction uh, because we are waiting to uh, hear Beno's lecture. Beno, you can share and uh, start your lecture. 
Uh, good evening, um, everyone. I would like to thank my friend, Professor Nirmal, Dr. Kailas, Dr. Dilip Kumar, and all the colleagues uh, from the Odisha Orthopedic Association and Association of Surgeons of India from the uh, Odisha State Chapter. I'm uh, Professor Venu Kawataku. I'm an orthopedic consultant, uh, and I'm going to share our experience in the surgical reconstruction of Charcot foot. Greetings from London and from King's College Hospital. Charcot neuroarthropathy was actually described a long time ago mm -hmm. in 1868 by Sean Martin Charcot in patients with in patients with Tavis dorsalis. But its association with diabetes was established much later by Jordan in, in 1936. Even then, the pathology, pathophysiology of Charcot is still not very clear. There are multiple theories, but it's not very completely uh, uh, understood. But we know that this is associated with peripheral neuropathy. It is known to decrease the life expectancy of those individuals that develop by about 14 years. And the lower extreme amputation rate is quite significant. We uh, at King's Cross Hospital, we, we, we are the first ones to establish the multidisciplinary diabetes foot clinic about 40 years ago. And a large practice uh, of mine is in dealing with shock of foot reconstructions. Uh, and uh, I would like to share our experience. By and large, a patient um, with an acute charcot presents with a sudden, unexplained, painless, red, warm, and swollen foot uh, with no significant history of trauma. The patient may say that I woke up this morning and cannot get my foot inside my shoe, or I was walking along and I suddenly heard a crack and my foot started swelling up. And Professor Michael Edmonds, the diabetologist, uh, who has studied extensively, has written a few books about this. When you examine, uh, you see, you know, a, a warm, swollen, red foot and ankle, and there can be a deformity if the presentation is late, and there can even be crepitus or in advanced presentations uh, as back of bones. Uh, it is known that the charcot uh, in acute phase results in raised temperature locally, and it is very useful to measure the temperature difference uh, using any device uh, and compare with the opposite normal foot. And if it's more than two degrees, that is considered as significant. So in an acute shark coat, uh, some trivial primary injury uh, usually triggers this uncontrolled inflammation due to lack of neuro neurological control from peripheral neuropathy. Uh, and the patient doesn't have normal sensation due to neuropathy, so doesn't experience any pain. So the patient continues to walk, causing secondary trauma, and that uh, establishes the ac acute, which is active shock coat. But if offloaded adequately, it develops uh, into inactive status. And eventually, with continued offloading, the shock coat heals. But during this process, Quite often, most of the feet develop deformities, and that deformity uh, through heel charcot becomes permanent. So I would like to re-emphasize that a red, warm, swollen foot should be considered as an acute charcot until proved otherwise. It can also be due to other conditions such as um, cellulitis, infection, but by and large, if the skin is intact, it is almost always an acute charcot. So you should ask the patient to uh, offload through non-weight bearing. And if you don't de deal with such presentations, you should refer the patient to the regional center immediately. Uh, plain radiographs are extremely helpful. Uh, they also help us identify the staging of the acute shock hurt. During the first stage, you see a lot of bone fragmentation and later the fragmented bones can coalesce and finally consolidate into uh, a deformed rigid shock coat, that is stage three. And we know that uh, pre-radiographic stage exists where the, plain, the clinical presentation of an acute shock coat, but with normal radiographs. But if you do advanced imaging, such as an MRI or CT spec, you can clearly see those changes. And that is given a separate staging, the pre-radiographic stage or stage zero. And it is very helpful if we diagnose these uh, conditions in stage zero or at least in stage one. We're not going to go through 
the detailed non-operative treatment. We'll focus on the surgical treatment, but by and large, an acute shock cord should be managed with uh, uh, offloading, ideally in a total contact cast. If you want to see the technique of uh, total contact casting, you can um, see this YouTube uh, video, uh, but the steps are that you, know, you apply uh, well-conformed cast, uh, including the toes, uh, and then you know, the, ideally in an acute shock cord, the patient is recommended to mobilize non-weight bearing, but you know, some form of weight bearing is allowed uh, in early stages. Uh, in addition to uh, the total contact cast, which is considered as a gold standard, one can apply, one can consider a bivalve total contact cast or a, a crankshaft um, crow walker or even the commercially available braces uh, if the foot shape is normal. So uh, an acute shock hood often responds very well to immediate offloading and through different stages reaches the consolidation phase. And in many patients, you know, the deformity may not be significant enough so that they can walk in surgical shoes quite well. But if the deformity is significant, uh, particularly if they plant a bone prominence, uh, quite often exostectomy becomes necessary if the patient develops ulceration or impending ulceration. But if the deformity is quite marked, reconstruction becomes necessary. So this is the standard um, uh, progressive phase of an acute shock cord progressing to a chronic deformed shock cord. But however, some of these acute shock cord presentations continue uh, with instability and progressive deformity despite your uh, good offloading technique. And those can develop this foot at risk situation where you know the, the offloading measures do not work, but in front of our eyes, the foot continues to develop a limb threatening situation. And this uh, one example in a 62-year-old uh, type 1 uh, with peripheral neuropathy, no significant trauma developed uh, this kind of osseous damage, clearly an acute shock cord. And you can see the medial cuneiform has extruded. And with that degree of extrusion, you can imagine that if the patient continues to mobilize in, in, in regular shoes, it results in skin necrosis, ulceration, osteomyelitis, and so on. So this is a, 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 an acute shock cord with foot at risk presentation. So that requires uh, a, an immediate surgical intervention. We don't wait until this uh, this goes into stage two or stage three. So uh, aggressive debridement, excise all of that infected bone. Uh, and on this occasion, we had to do this as a two-stage procedure because the infection was very aggressive and active. And the first stage involved in excision of the uh, exposed and osteomyelitic medial cuneiform and the local debridement. And then once the... Uh, uh, you know, the infection status we are happy with, then went back in on this occasion about 10 days time and uh, and uh, internal fixation. So here we are actually doing this surgery while the shock coat is very active. So the foot um, softish swelling hasn't really completely gone. But because the foot is at risk, we have to do this way. So in this situation, we may not be able to achieve wound closure. The options are uh, they do local flap. Uh, but this patient, as it with many patients, uh, the vascular status doesn't allow free flaps. So vac dressing is beautiful. You know, it works very well for most patients. We were, I was planning to do skin graft, and I didn't have to. Do. So we achieved good skin closure. So the patient was able to come as full weight bearing at five months time. Another example of an acute hind foot shock cord, uh, this patient came from abroad, and you can see the leg uh, was uh, immobilized in a cast, and you know the, the cast shape is quite different to the, the leg shape, and this patient with multiple comorbidities and in a real limb uh, at risk uh, situation. So such uh, presentations uh, need to be aggressively managed. The medial malleolus is exposed through the, through the wound. So this also requires as a two-stage procedure. During the first stage, uh, you excise all of that uh, exposed uh, and potentially infected and clearly infected bones here. The medial malleolus had to be excised. Uh, you prepare, uh, the, do the bone cuts and correct the deformity and temporary stabilization with, uh, with wires and give uh, intravenous antibiotics and local antibiotic eluding material, which I will dis dis describe in more detail towards the end of uh, this presentation. And then 
uh, you proceed with definitive fixation here. The subtalar joint was also prepared and uh, a hind foot nail on this occasion provided predictable bone fusion, uh, deformity uh, correction, and the patient was able to commence full weight bearing. So in such type of uh, acute limit risk presentations, it is good to surgically intervene early. But most sharp cord foot uh, deformed presentations come as chronic or inactive deformities with our midfoot or the hind foot with such uh, significant deformities uh, without adequate offloading, they develop ulceration, uh, infection, osteomyelitis, and then the risk of uh, limb loss. Uh, the problem with limb loss in people with sharp coat or diabetes is that the mortality following a baloney amputation or a major amputation in people with diabetes is extremely high. Uh, and many people are not aware of that. It is much higher than most common cancers, you know, about 50 to 70 person dying within five years. In fact, the most recent uh, studies revealed that 80% five-year mortality uh, in people with diabetes. So it is really important that we achieve functional limb salvage so that the patient remains ambulatory status. So we went through the algorithm. If the deformity is uh, localized uh, minor with bone extrusion, as, as you can see uh, in this particular example, chronic repeated uh, ulceration with repeated infective episodes with that exostosis and that type of uh, presentation uh, you know, may be difficult for a continued offloading. So surgical intervention becomes necessary. Here, the calcaneal pitch is also abnormal. There are significant abnormalities in the uh, midfoot and forefoot mechanics. So that needs to be corrected as well. Uh, so aggressive uh, ulcer debridement, debridement of all of that infected material down to the bone and the uh, bone exostectomy, remove all of that bone. But that is not sufficient here because the Achilles tendon is very tight, causing uh, abnormal calcaneal pitch. And you will hear a lot more about this from the, uh, in the, in the uh, next talk. So uh, you can clearly see in this picture, the, the calcaneal pitch has improved. The patient has got plantigrade foot, a large uh, soft tissue defect created from exostectomy and ulcer excision with vac dressing healed completely. So, uh, and the patient was able to uh, weight bear, commence weight bearing at about a uh, five month mark. Here, a, a midfoot reconstruction would be even better, but the patient was not keen. Um, so, whereas major deformities uh, through due to sharp foot, either the midfoot or hind foot, are infected or non infected, they come in so many different uh, presentations. The, the, the key feature here in this particular treatment is to achieve functional limb salvage, not just keeping the foot, but it has to be functional so that the patient can maintain mobility, it, the foot shape can improve so that it can be showable, so that you can prevent ulceration and ulceration, the cascade of events resulting in limb loss. So that is achieved through a reconstruction um, procedure. But historically, uh, shock of foot reconstruction wasn't considered uh, routinely because of various challenges. The bone stock is very poor. Bone healing potential is very poor. And they come with ulcerations, problems with skin coverage. Uh, internal fixation, the commonest fixation technique we use is known to fail. And external fixation is not tolerated well in this group of patients. Certainly in the UK, my patients don't like external fixation and they don't keep the fixator for long enough uh, to achieve the goal of you know, permanent deformity correction bone fusion. So Traditionally, these patients were offered a bilonia amputation. We know that it is not a, a favorable outcome through bilonia amputation. And we have recently done a systematic review. And it's interesting to see that internal fixation, uh, which is in blue, uh, is, is becoming more common uh, technique of shock of reconstruction. And there are specific principles of uh, this fixation. Uh, we uh, if we if we if we share our experience earlier experience uh, through the midfoot reconstruction technique, so a standard midfoot shark coat that was managed in those days about 17 or 18 years ago uh, through segmental fixation technique, as we do for degenerative um, uh, deformity correction procedures. But in shark coat, that doesn't work because the bone doesn't uh, have good healing ability and the soft tissue imbalance 
is quite marked. The deformity simply returns. So the routine segmental fixation doesn't work. It has to be a long segment, rigid fixation with optimal bone opposition. That is the mantra we use uh, for shock of foot reconstruction fixation techniques. In this example of very simple midfoot shock coat with rocker uh, bottom deformity, and before the patient has shock coat, he had normal foot shape. And here uh, we do, you know, plantar and a medial based uh, wedge resection to correct the deformity to align the first metatarsal uh, to the uh, to the talus um, and again fixed with rigid fixation on this occasion using locking plates of the medial and lateral column and this was done almost uh, 10 years ago uh, and the patient uh, has remained ambulatory uh, since then 11 years now so another example of infected midfoot shark coat. This is slightly more complex deformity, and this particular deformity is called subluxation uh, type. And here, you know, there is plantar ulcer as well, but it was not actually infected. So we did everything in one go. It's critical that you identify and map the dorsalis pedis and uh, posterior arteries when you do midfoot reconstructions uh, by doing Doppler, excise ulcer, redrape the foot. And again, do the deform deformity correction through osteotomies and fix using the long segment rigid fixation technique. Nowadays, most of this is achieved through beams. And you can see the medial and lateral column beams used on this example. And this also resulted in very predictable deformity correction. As soon as you achieve deformity correction, the ulcer heals and it stays healed. And then the patient has been infection free. When it comes to hind foot, the fixation principles are exactly the same, and we have described those in this particular paper. So this example of hind plus hind foot plus midfoot reconstruction with previous recurrent infections from uh, the deformity and patient has been load bearing along the lateral border of the midfoot. Here again, the same principles: uh, prepare the ankle and subtalar joints, uh, correct the tightness of Achilles tendon, uh, plus. Uh, you know, long segment rigid fixation of the hind foot and the midfoot through the first uh, medial column uh, correction. And here uh, we use the antibiotic uh, loaded local um, uh, eluting material as well to achieve infection eradication. So a different uh, fixation principle in this, um, in this case example of very flail uh, hind foot uh, but with severe bone loss. So on this occasion, you know, it's, it's impossible to achieve uh, rigid fixation of the hind foot due to the amount of bone loss, particularly in the rotational alignment. Uh, so for that, we like to extend the medial column plate onto distal tibia that provides rotational rigidity of the construct as well. And that seemed to work amazingly well uh, in, these, uh, in, in such presentations. Uh, even more uh, exam example of more um, and rigid uh, severe deformity of the hind foot plus midfoot with recurrent infections. And uh, you can clearly see on this uh, radiographs, uh, very severe deformity. And here there was, uh, you know, SFA occlusion as well. That has to be addressed first. We always uh, correct the vascular problem first before uh, proceeding with the reconstruction. We tend to do the reconstruction, uh, deformity correction about, you know, four to six weeks following the vascular procedure. Very extensile extend a lateral approach, correct the ankle deformity first, and then subtalar, then join uh, them, all of them uh, line up line up, and uh, achieve compressive rigid fixation. And the residual midfoot deformity is corrected through the same principles, using the same principles I described earlier. And this patient has been ambulatory uh, for a long time. Clearly, most importantly, infection hasn't returned. So we have, you know, published our outcomes through various uh, publications uh, and you know and predominantly you have seen non actually infected shock of foot reconstructions but there are occasions where an uh, actual infected uh, shock of feet present with uh, present for functional limb salvage as in this example uh, of pouring uh, pus through failed previous uh, multiple surgery such presentations require very methodical two-stage reconstruction during the first stage here, all the infected material was excised, the metalwork was removed, and you, you use the standard principles of aggressive surgical deployment and uh, physical removal of all the infected antibiotic eluding material used to achieve
local infection eradication, and the choice of the antibiotic depends upon perhaps these uh, deep tissue specimen cultures. Once you achieve uh, infection eradication through this aggressive deployment and correct the deformity at the same time and provide stability through these uh, threaded wires, uh, you tend to see quite rapid and predictable soft tissue healing with simple measure, measures such as vac dressing. And once we are happy that uh, the infection has been eradicated, generally, you know, after six weeks, you monitor the CRP that still comes down and stays down, and you make a uh, surgical plan on how to reconstruct on this occasion using hind foot nail plus midfoot plates and beams. Uh, and local antibiotic eluding material was injected into the into the gaps again to remove any residual uh, in, in infection, potential infection. And it's really critical that we achieve long segment rigid fixation. Otherwise, the bone healing response is uh, poor or unpredictable. And this patient also had very successful outcome. We, uh, a 26 patient series has just been accepted for uh, publication, two stage reconstructions uh, of shock or feet in the BJJ. So that will come out maybe in a, in a few weeks' time. So just to reemphasize, these require very proactive vascular management as well. And you, 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 we have described about the targeted infection control and advanced wound care. And most of our patients require vac dressing only, and most of them are not suitable for a, a, a complex local flaps. Uh, but the critical component, what we learned, is this durable fixation principle. And it has to be a patient-centered, multidisciplinary approach um, and in our unit, that uh, unit, uh, that team is led by the diabetologist, um, Professor Edmonds, uh, and a bit support from, uh, from the surgeons. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. And those who are interested in learning more about uh, diabetic foot surgery and shark foot reconstructions and the, mul and the multidisciplinary care, I would like to invite you to attend uh, our uh, Sharko uh, meeting uh, uh, meeting in, in, in September, um, and you know you will you know you can join this meeting virtually or physically. Perhaps physically is for uh, local uh, delegates in the UK. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, uh, Thank you, Dr. Venu. Um, uh, sorry about your presentation quality because uh, of your traveling, you told. So, but anyway, it was very informative. And I have seen your uh, center, how fantastic work you people are doing in King's College. Uh, maybe sometimes we'll have um, more opportunity to listen to you and uh, um, um, in contact you. So, all along for last few years, you have been advising us how to manage our uh, uh, sarcophores, and maybe even I have done three for surgery with your guidance to success. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, uh, uh, I uh, invite Dr. Madhu to start his talk on external fixation of sarcophores, and we will take the questions uh, after he finishes the lectures. Madhu, please, share your skin. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, audible. Okay, and can you see my slides? Sure, sure, okay, carry okay. on. Okay, that's great. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nimal, uh, and it's a pleasure to be part of this meeting. So here, I'm going to, so first of all, my name is Madhya Tiruvidla, as you've been introduced. Uh, I'm going to take a completely different talk uh, to what Professor Venu has talked. Here, I've been working with diabetes for the last three to four years. I do reconstruction, but my talk today is going to talk about the pre-operative things which we can do to avoid for the development of the deformity and also how we can prevent things worsening. So we've got to talk about the soft tissue balancing and other preventive measures. So we know that the diabetes is associated with more than 60% of the amputation. And one of the precursors of an amputation in a diabetic patient is the ulceration. And the incidence is around 19 to 34%, depending upon which publication you look at. So in this talk, we're going to talk about how does a midfoot charcoal deformity develop? 
what are the deforming forces that works on it, and what early intervention we can do to prevent progression of the deformity, and how do you quantify if there's a deformity and how it's progressing and when to act. So you know that this is a typical midfoot chakra deformity. It has a deformity both on the coronal plane and also on the sagittal plane. So if you look at the sagittal plane, the first thing you notice is there is a significant hind foot equinus. So the red line describes the equinus and the whole complex of the hind foot is just tilted downwards. And the most deforming force is due to tightness of the calf and hamstring uh, and tendo achilles, which becomes tight. So, and then as the patient walks, there's a ground reaction force on the forefoot, uh, which causes a counterbalance lever. And as a result, the midfoot breaks. Uh, and, uh, and as the, and the deformity progresses, uh, as the bones start to protrude to the skin and the people develop ulceration and the bony prominences. In the coronal plane, when the deformity starts at the midfoot, uh, the rest of the midfoot start to go onto one side. Most commonly, it goes to abduction due to the intact perineal bravis pushing on the fifth metatarsal and causing the fifth, mer fifth toe uh, to abduct, abduct. Now, it can be a simple two-plane deformity of abduction, or if the perineal tertius is acting, it causes a pronation deformity as well. Sometimes, very rarely, you can see an adduction deformity, uh, which is very rare. Now, this is due to the tightness of tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior tendons. We all know that the deformity typically starts on the mid uh, at the middle column and then slowly involve the middle, middle column and then the lateral column. The coronal plane deformity, although the bony prominences you can see, and often this can cause bony bump on the middle side, uh, which can be a problem with the shoe wear, but often very rarely uh, produces ulceration on the middle side of the foot. So we worried about the plantar surface of the foot. So question is, how does this happen? And how do we quantify it? And can we do something to stop it? So question is, how does this happen? We all know that the patient with the diabetic, uh, long-term diabetes, mostly with uncontrolled diabetes, they start to have a peripheral neuropathy. Now that can be a sensory neuropathy, motor neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy, and a combination of it. And the motor neuropathy is the most critical bit. It starts distally, affecting the lumbricals of the toes first, that's why they all have a clotto deformity and then progresses proximally to involve the major muscles. And one of the common muscles is the calf muscle, which is the gastroxoleus complex and tendo achilles. So there's various studies has been done and which shows that the effect of the neuropathy on the complex and the large muscles is by producing a contraction of the muscles. So the gastroxoleus muscles contracts and then there are electronic microscopic changes uh, seen in the tendo achilles uh, collagen fibers uh, with the glycosylation, etc., that causes a shortening of the tendon fibers as well. So you got a contracted muscle and a shortened muscle, which produces a quite significant hind foot equinus. As a result, you got a significant equinus deformity. Now, how do you quantify it? So, the, where, looking at the literature again, various people have suggested uh, various X ray findings but that we need a standard X-ray. These are the standard X-ray what we do in our department. Uh, we a standard AP of the foot and a lateral of the foot and ankle shown on the single plane radiograph. So the first one you talk about the calcaneal pitch. Calcaneal pitch describes the hind foot equinus. Normal between 18 to 20. Uh, it is an angle between the inferior surface of the calcaneum to the weight bearing axis of lateral column, which is the, from the calcaneum to the fifth metatarsal. And on the lateral view, we also look at the what you call a lateral Mary's line or angle, which is a straight line across the first metatarsal to the tailor body and neck. And if there's a break in that Mary's line, we can say that the middle column is broken. But the most important thing is something called cuboid height. It is the height of the cuboid in relation to the weight bearing axis. So the weight bearing axis from the calcaneum to the fifth metatarsal and the perpendicular line from that line to the inferior part of the cuboid is called cuboid height. So as I mentioned, as the deformity progresses from the medial to lateral side, uh, the medial column, when it breaks, it causes uh, deformity, but it does not cause ulceration. But when the lateral column is involved and when the cuboid drops down, uh, that causes ulceration. So there is a critical point which we'll describe in future. 
So we talk about the Q line A, which is the meris line, line C, which is the cuboid height. And on the AP view, we talk about the dorsal meris line. Now, this is only an importance when we're reconstructing the foot because obviously we, this not, does not cause ulceration itself. So significance, as I mentioned, if the, uh, the, the midfoot collapses and if the cuboid drops down below this line, that can cause pressure and a classic rocker bottom deformity and ulceration on the plantar lateral side of the foot. So we noticed that the uh, combination of the equinus deformity from the tightness of the calf muscle and tendo Achilles causes equinus foot, uh, equinus hind foot, and equinus hind foot with the uh, counterbalance at the ground reaction force of the forefoot causes failure of the osseous ligament structures in the midfoot, resulting in midfoot break. So uh, again, looking at the literature, various people have talked about tendo Achilles lengthening. Uh, in patient with uh, uh, midfoot chakot. Now, most of these procedures have been described in theater, but by itself, the tendo Achilles lengthening is reduced to, um, is known to improve the dorsiflexion, reduces the peak plantar pressures of the forefoot and also the midfoot, and improves the overall walking ability. Uh, so, the people uh, in the literature, if you look at it, they described about tendo, tendo Achilles lengthening and total contact cast, known to reduce. Uh, the peak plantar pressure and ulceration more in the forefoot than at the midfoot level. So we've been doing uh, tendo Achilles lengthening, but not in theater, but in the clinic. So we've been uh, practicing tendo Achilles lengthening in the clinic since 2018. All these procedures carried under local anesthetic. We included all the patients who present to us with a midfoot chakra deformity, but excluded patients who have obvious ulceration and osteomyelitis because they need surgical intervention or when they have a combined hind foot and midfoot chakot deformity. So the, the procedures are done by two orthopedic surgeons in the department and one medical endocrinologist. We, uh, we got the approval from the hospital governance team for the procedure. Uh, and as I mentioned, we use for midfoot chakot, but also we use for four foot ulcers. I'll talk that in a minute. And also in a patient who are quite thickened of uh, uh, plantar callosities in the forefoot. So the procedure, uh, is performed after a written consent, uh, supine position. Um, some people, one of the surgeons do prone position, it doesn't matter, uh, but uh, we usually use a hockey technique, which is a hemisection of the tendo Achilles. We do one cut on the middle side, one cut on the lateral side, a third cut if the correction is not fully completed. But often we just do only two cuts. But the most important thing is we avoid pushing the whole foot into dorsiflexion. We just do the simple cuts and apply a, to a total contact cast straight away and let the patient walk. And when the, when the patient walks, the tendo Achilles lengthens to the optimal position and stabilizes accordingly. So we don't force the foot into dorsiflexion. So our, uh, our post-procedure protocol is walking plaster cast for six weeks time. Uh, we give a thrombal prophylaxis to prevent uh, risk of deep venous thrombosis. Uh, and we do a weight bearing radiographs at six weeks time and compare the angles, what we just described. Uh, after six weeks, they come out with the plaster cast and they go into walking boot. So we noticed the improvement in the calcaneal pitch in patients before and after tendo Achilles lengthening. So this is a pre-procedure and this is a post-procedure uh, calcaneal pitch. So now we'll, we want to quantify how, what we're doing, is it effective in patients with diabetes? So we looked at the present classification systems, they are very good. They describe where the problem is, describe in anatomy and how it's progressing. But what it does not do is describe what can be done to treat it on a particular level. So we sat around and designed a new classification system, looking at the clinical and radical findings, and then correlated uh, with the uh, treatment plan, what we can offer. So we described a new classification system. We designed a classification system from stage Z1 to stage four. Stage one is similar to Akenhorst stage zero. Stage two, which divides stage two A and two B, is a stage of pre-ulceration. But once there's ulceration, stage three, and when there's a combined deformity of hind foot and midfoot, is stage four. So this is stage one deformity, where it's similar to Akenhorst stage zero. Often the child person comes to us with a hot swollen foot, as uh, Prof. Wagner just described. They have 
no uh, previous problem, just uh, diabetes, and they woke up with a hot, painful, swollen foot. There is a temperature difference, uh, and the X-ray shows no changes on any of the X-ray parameters. Uh, so treatment we offer is to tend to at least lengthening straight away in the clinic, followed by weight-bearing uh, total contact cast, as I just described. In stage 2A, where there is a break in the midfoot, as we just seen here, but the cuboid height is well above, so it's a positive cuboid height. Uh, again, most commonly a patient present in at this stage uh, with a acute charcoal foot, um, and again, the treatment will be tendo at least lengthening followed by total contact cast. Once the deformity has stabilized and we notice on the follow-up X-ray there is no progression, then we worry about what we do with the residual deformity. Either we uh, refer to them for a, a customized orthotics or a shoe wear, or if the bony prominence is too bad, then we excise the bony prominence. But we follow it up to make sure that the, the deformity is not progressing. So stage 2B, which is an extension of what we've seen in stage 2A, but here the cuboid has dropped below the line of the weight bearing. So it's a negative cuboid height. Uh, so the risk of that one is because it's pushing on the skin, hence the risk of ulceration is very high. But they haven't got the ulcer yet, but the risk is high. At this stage, we do it again, tendocris lengthening with total contact cast, and then see what happens. Most of the time, the disease stabilizes. If it stabilizes, we just excise the bony lump or try to accommodate in the specialized insoles. But if they, if they progress on the X-ray and the skin is at risk, then we go with a single stage reconstruction as just Prof. Vedu has described. So stage three is a stage of ulceration. Now the, uh, it's too far and the skin has broken down and there is osteomyelitis. Uh, at this stage, tendoachilles lengthening and other non operative treatment are difficult. However, we notice that there are two types of ulcers are seen, depend upon what stage are present. It could be a, a simple superficial one or deep one. But the, the, the critical point of many angle between the line, two lines of more than 27 degrees is considered too critical that it can be salvaged with non operative treatment. So we notice that the 3A uh, of stage 3 is a superficial ulcer with no evidence of osteomyelitis on the MR scan. A 3B would be an ulcer with osteomyelitis. So in patients with 3A, we still try to save them with the tendo increase lengthening with total contact cast and see what happens. Uh, but however, if the deformity is progressing or if the ulcer is not healing, then we go with a two-stage reconstruction as Dr. Prof. Vedder described. But in 3B, we directly go for two-stage reconstruction. So stage four is a combined deformity of the midfoot and hindfoot, where there is an, uh, either a complete involvement of the ankle or subtalar joint, uh, or the midfoot has an ulcer or without ulcer. So it's a combined deformity. And uh, again, as Prof. Vendu described, we do a combined correction of the hindfoot and also of the midfoot, as the, as the um, XA shows. So we start with the hind foot and then we go with the midfoot fixation. It depends upon the ulcer. If there's an ulcer or osteomyelitis, we do it in two stages. So what's our research? From 2018 onwards, uh, for just for midfoot charcoal, we followed them a minimum for one year. So we've been doing from uh, 2018 and we got a lot of patients, but we collected the first few, we completed at least one year follow-up. So we done in 33 feet, uh, and, and these are the distribution of the patient. Uh, and as you can see, most patients present with a 2A condition. So these are the results of the tendoachilles lengthening. That's very important. In stage one, which is Eichenhold stage zero, if you've got an acute chakra foot, and if you do a tendoachilles lengthening and a weight wearing total contact cast, 100% of the people recover and do not progress. Although we do follow up X-ray up to one year, and none of them progressed enough that we need to do anything further in the future. In stage 2A, 8,600 people, they recovered. Uh, and only two of the people, they progressed to stage 2B disease. Now, that's because of the other factors, uh, but at least 86% of people we avoided progressing to the next stage. In stage 2B, where the deformity is so significant, it start pushing on the skin, okay, we stopped uh, ulceration in the people by 100%. Uh, 
none of the people have progressed to needing a ulcer treatment. They needed an exostectomy at most, but that's about it. But in stage 3A, when they already got an ulcer, which is superficial, we still managed to save them by 75%. And only one of the stage 3A, but it's only four feet, so it's not uh, large numbers, where they went on to needing a, a two-stage reconstruction. Again, uh, if you look at the calcaneal pitch, it's improved by an average of six degrees. Uh, earlier we see the more uh, calcaneal pitch improvement we see. But more importantly, in some patients, especially in 2B, when the disease is already progressed, if you do tender excess lengthening, the disease process improves. So stage 2B becomes stage 2A uh, in three feet, we see in that. So again, uh, we want to check whether the classification system were to describe, is it a valid one? So we give it to 12 people, uh, three or four uh, orthopedic consultants, uh, radiologists, a podiatric, uh, podiatrist who work with us, a medical consultant, and a vascular consultant, because these are the part of MDT. So I've uh, given 10 slides at two settings uh, and asked them to grade them. Uh, and these are our results based on the grading. So as you can see, both the inter-observer and intra-observer agreement is quite good and is excellent. So this has been published uh, in the uh, May Journal of the uh, JCOT. Now, progressing the same thing about tender acres lengthening, what is started with, with four foot ulcers, then we sort of extend to midfoot ulcers. So we've been doing for the four foot ulcers from 2018 onwards. And we so far we've done, I think around 200 patients who have four foot ulcers um, and who at least have completed six months of follow-up. As you can see with the four-foot ulcer, we do a procedure, pre-procedure, two weeks and six weeks, the ulcer has healed. So uh, this is when I started, did the audit, uh, 96 patients, 109 feet, minimum six months follow-up. And earlier during our learning curve, uh, we had a complete transaction of the tendon in three patients. That's the reason why I said we should not do a forceful dorsiflexion of the foot. So in four foot ulcer, just by doing tender acres lengthening, we avoided uh, going back to theater and achieved full ulcer healing in 96% of the people. And also dorsiflexion improved, obviously. So in summary, plantar four foot ulceration is a very critical negative uh, factor for development of osteomyelitis and thereafter <coughs> amputation in diabetic patient. Ulceration results in amputation. Hence, whatever we have to do we have to do it early to prevent that ulceration. As the Prof. Wendy mentioned, the five-year mortality after amputation is around 80% plus. Therefore, early recognition and identification of potentially modifying factor is very important to prevent amputation. And tight calf muscles, which is a most dynamic uh, deforming force, um, has to be dealt with whenever the patient is seen early on. So percutaneous tender lengthening in outpatient setting is very safe and very effective in utilizing this forming force. Hence, I strongly recommend early tender acres lengthening in all the charcoal patients you see in the clinic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Madhu. Uh, please stay back for questions, Ajay. So before uh, we uh, go for questions, I, um, I will ask you some expert uh, our panels, some expert opinions. Uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll request Professor S. R. Pandey to tell about the medical management and uh, pathogenesis of these uh, uh, sarcophores, diabetic sarcophores, especially. And that is most important, I think, along with the management of this uh, uh, orthopedic management of uh, sarcophores. Thank you, Dr. Mab. Now, joint destruction is only part of the story. The mortality is also three times higher in diabetic sarcosan disease. Oh God. And as Dr. Menu said, this gets even more magnified in patients who underwent who undergo surgery. So we have to take a holistic approach on this issue. 
we have to treat the joint there is no doubt about that but we have to also treat the diabetes and neuropathy as well the surgical management has been comprehensively discussed i shall limit myself to some points regarding medical management in the medical management the first management concerning the bones and joints do we have any any treatment modality for that very few you know if you go by pathogenesis the rankle is the culprit the rankle which is generated by different um, cytokines activates osteoclasts and these osteoclasts are unusually more active and they produce the bone damage so what about anti resorptive medications which should tame the osteoclasts we have bisphosphonates calcitonins and denosumab there are many trials regarding with all these medications but the treatment is not very satisfactory there are plus minus benefits with these agents so if you want to go ahead you can go for a you can try with these agents but one thing before you go for these first points first correct if there is any vitamin d deficiency vitamin d deficiency can produce osteopenia at the same time if this particular sand used in the situation there may be calcium metabolism disturbances now since we don't have much medication in this regard we have to limit ourselves for the management of diabetes and neuropathy which is very important unless the diabetes is managed properly all your efforts will go in vain now how to manage diabetes in this situation i will suggest only one agent and that is insulin please don't try with other oral drugs insulin is the only treatment in this situation and if the diabetes is properly controlled our management issues will be easy here i would like to mention about one anti diabetic drug these are known as glyphosates why i am mentioning it these drugs are recently introduced in the last 5 6 years these drugs are being used very widely because this is the only group of anti diabetic agents which can help in heart failure and nephropathy these drugs are versatile with very lots of pleiotropic effects hence many diabetologists are fond of using these medications but these medications some of these medications like canagliflozin results in increased risk of amputation so if your patient is under oral drugs please see what drugs the patient is taking similarly if the patient is taking steroids or some other immune suppressive agents please take note note of that blood sugar proper blood sugar control will go a long way in managing our patients besides this we have to take care of obesity also obesity is a risk factor for sarcoidosis disease hypertension needs also attention for neuropathy we don't have much drugs the aldose reductase inhibitors which are introduced were proved to be futile so we have to depend upon pharma i mean vitamins and nutraceuticals like methyl cobalamin and alpha lipoic acid thank you so thank you uh, professor patnai i have heard about the age what is this uh, advanced glyco role of advanced glyco uh, semic products end products in uh, formation of this uh, um, diabetic food i could not hear it properly you can please repeat it is advanced glycosemic advanced uh, end products glycosylosin end products what happens now when 
proteins, body proteins, which can be anything, any protein, whether it can be hemoglobin or whether it can be a collagen, whether it is a muscle protein or whether it is a DNA, RNA, now, any protein which is exposed to high blood sugar levels, this undergoes structural changes. And these structural changes compromises with their function and structure. So this is the reason why, for example, <coughs> Dr. Madhu was telling about so much about but why Achilles tendons get certain in the first place? Who certain it? The mechanical problems of the part is this glycosylation of these collagens. That's the, that's the possibility of the tendon shortening in Achilles tendon in diabetes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Bernay. I'll ask uh, Banasar one question before uh, others and uh, Banasar and then ask questions to Dr. Beno and Madhu. Banasar, I read somewhere that uh, those foods, circus foods, having more circulation are more prone for diabetic uh, sarcophore than having less circulation. What is your take on that? Uh, thank you, Nirmal. Good evening to all the dignitaries and the audience. I think Nirmal has chosen a wrong person in the right subject. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I cannot answer, answer to your question. But but I can tell a summary of the charcot's foot or the charcot's joint in my experience over several years being a faculty with Professor Kesi Mahapatra and as a good student of him during his seminars on diabetic food. And my personal experience since we are dealing with the most of the diabetic food at the first instance in the surgical OPD. My experience is that whatever patients they have presented into the OPD as abscess, ulcers, cellulitis, and many a times uh, gangrene and septicemia. But I have seen that those patients who have presented with cellulitis has undergone minor amputation. They are so careful in life. They have not, never suffered from a charcot's foot. Who have suffered, those who have small ulcer has healed. They have not been followed up properly. They have suffered from foot. Circus foot, when they come to us, we refer to the orthopedic surgeon or to the diabetic foot surgeons. Only my feeling is that it is because of the illiteracy of the patients, ignorance of the patient, and lack of awareness about the future complications of the diabetic ulcer or the diabetic cellulitis. That is why I always advise that there must be. This is almost a preventable disease and this prevention can be done only by care of the control of the diabetes with the wise help of the and advice of Sudhiranjan. And if this would be properly taught how to take care of the foot, not only care of the diabetes, and they must be educated with pictorial knowledge about the progression of the disease, including the vascularity also. What I feel, your question was mainly on vascularity. I think a impaired vascularity, impaired neuropathy, and obesity, along with a lack of control diabetes, or the smoking, alcohol, all are additive factors to jeopardize the vascularity, to increase the neuropathy, and the patient might land in a charcoal food. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, Professor Padnay. Here, here, I would like to add one point while I agree fully with Dr. Misra. Now, one thing what happens in diabetes, now this becomes this because of neuropathy, there occurs alteration of vascular reflex. Okay? So that's why the blood supply to the food gets augmented and that occurs arteriovenous sounds. Hence, blood supply to the bones gets increased. 
more blood supply to the bones, more of cytokines, and more of mononuclear cells leads to more of osteoclast activation and more of osteolysis. Now, what happens in this? Now, why I'm telling these things? Because, you know, neuropathy is a very common problem in diabetes. But Sarkar's neuropathy is very rare. Why it is that is so? Hardly how many percents, percentage of patients get Sarkar's disease? The different literature says 2 to 10 percent. Maybe less. But neuropathy is seen in 50 to 60 percent or even more higher. So if the neuro, we say neuropathy is the culprit, then why such a small percentage of patients, they suffer from this disease? Now, as I said, because of arteriovenous sun, the blood supply to the bones gets uh, um, augmented and more blood reaches the bones and most osteolysis and destruction. So in this setting, any disease which jeopardizes vascular supply to the limbs, so any patient having some degree of peripheral vascular disease paradoxically gets some relief from the circus design. So this is a peculiar situation because one disease is protecting from the development of another disease. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I'll ask um, Professor Avanikan Misra his experience. Uh, he is the almost, he has more than 30 to 35, almost 35 years experience in managing orthopedics problems and he must be using, uh, treating this diabetic foot. Uh, let us ask his experience and role of uh, osteophos uh, like bisphosphonates in management of uh, um, circuit sport. Good evening, all. I think uh, Dr. Modhu and uh, Dr. Benu have nicely presented this uh, circuit food. And, uh, and also, of course, Dr. Patnai covered this medicine part of diabetics and then our Bono. And uh, he has given how to prevent ulceration. And that is the actual deeper problem for this food problem. <coughs> this is the main reason why the patient comes. And by the time the circus food develops, and after that only the orthopedicians are required. And uh, now uh, with my experience, what I see, that it is very difficult to do bony surgeries in these cases because you don't know what is the uh, this outcome that will be. In normal bone, when you want bone surgeries and you want fusion, when you want to do this exostosis excision, the the results are good. But in these cases, the failure are much more, and uh, it becomes very difficult. And that's why in our part, it is where this amputation below is becoming more common than uh, these things in previously. But now we have uh, we have also improved, and we are going for the surgeries. And my question too. Uh, Benu, is yes. is there any non-diabetic circus foods? What what they encounter? This is my question. Non-diabetic, and okay. why I am asking is recently I had a case just to, in the first stage when I did the debridement, I sent the tissue for biopsy, and yes. uh, this culture the culture became sterile, and uh, the tissue the histopathology that came as tuberculosis. And uh -huh. started anti tubercular and the patient is improving. So in diabetes, always it is not diabetes. Sometimes, but the case is diabetic. So what is the opinion I ask from Benu and Dr. Patnak? Sure. Uh, I think the, the culprit here is peripheral neuropathy. And peripheral neuropathy was more common due to other pathologies in the past. But now it is predominantly diabetes, as we all know. So, for example, peripheral neuropathy related to other uh, conditions. You know, we, we, you know, we, we include about, uh, I think, our diabetic food clinic, so-called diabetic food clinic, is actually peripheral neuropathy clinic. We take all referrals uh, of patients with peripheral neuropathy, not just diabetes. So, 17% of our foot, neuropathic foot-related presentations are actually non-diabetic. Peripheral neuropathy, not due to diabetes. It ranges from, you know, if we have a very few patients of congenital insensitivity to pain, or uh, patients spina bifida, uh, patients with very advanced 
Shako Mary Tooth with very marked peripheral neuropathy involvement uh, and so on. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and, you know, listening to yourself, Dr. Patnaik and the rest of the colleagues, you know, you have covered uh, so much on the, the non-surgical side, which is really important to, uh, to actually make sure that the delegates are fully made aware of. Uh, but interestingly, you know, the, the, the behavior of bone following reconstruction or any surgical procedures uh, were, uh, was found to be quite um, uh, unsatisfactory uh, or different in the past. And particularly when we used internal fixation technique, and, and no doubt, uh, and the, the failure rate was very high. And we used to just simply blame short coat bone and nothing else. But when we looked into the fixation techniques and principles, and we were in the past, we were applying just the fracture fixation principles. You know, when broken bone, when it is fixed, we use certain type of principles, and those principles were applied for shark or foot reconstruction as well. But unfortunately, they, they, they failed. So we were blaming just simply the bone. Shark or bone doesn't heal, but it does heal. And in fact, to our pleasant surprise, the bone healing rate is much, much better than what we had thought in the past, but it requires different type of uh, fixation principles. So the answer to your question, very important question about uh, neuropathy, if it is, uh, is if we need to, if it is the diabetes or, uh, or neuropathy component of diabetic complication, uh, if one of those is the culprit, we feel that it is the peripheral neuropathy. That is the main culprit. Peripheral neuropathy of any origin can cause shark coat, but those people with diabetes develop additional problems, include predominantly the vasculopathy. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, actually, I had read uh, somewhere that almost 50, more than 50% of patients with diabetic foot, they go into amputation. But you showed such fantastic results, it is quite heartening. Uh, there are yes. a few audience questions. Uh, I'll request one. Dr. Beno to answer one question. What is the correlation of Eisenhower staging and surgery for circus joint at present? Okay, I can. Uh, do, shall I take the uh, okay. Sure, sure. We, we had a very interesting observation. I can hold staging was initially uh, introduced to give chronological staging of the disease. Means every shark coat has to go through stage one, stage two, and stage three. So every stage one will become stage three. But since stage zero was introduced, in fact, we, we identified that that doesn't progress. It doesn't even start. If you, if you treat stage zero with total contact casting, absolute offloading, uh, now Dr. Madhu Thiruvidala describes about uh, at least standard release, which you know is currently being evaluated. But whatever you do, if you, as soon as you address the underlying mechanical and biological components, it stops. It doesn't go to stage one, doesn't go to stage three and four. So yes, uh, intervention during stage zero outcomes are fantastic. Stage one outcomes are very good. Uh, but, you know, when it, go, when it becomes to stage two or three, then you are dealing with much greater deformity. So, uh, there is another question from audience. Uh, when do you do gastronomous recession and when do you triple hemisection? Okay, Ma Ma Madhu will answer that question. I, I, yeah, I yeah. type and you I answer. that. Madhu is there? Uh, yes. Uh, my uh, so gastric recession uh, is purely because if I'm doing surgery in theater as a part of reconstruction, then uh, I tend to do gastric recession in theater. But if I'm doing in the outpatient department, then I will do hemisection. So what we do is basically, obviously, for all the, uh, such presentations, we do uh, silver coil test which differentiates if it is an isolated gastrocnemius contracture or full heel cord contracture. Uh, and of course, in non-neuropathic, non non-diabetic presentations, um, for example, in a plantar fasciitis, those kind of presentations, you see gastrocnemius contracture a lot more often. It's very rare that we see full heel cord contracture. But interestingly, as, as Dr. Thiruvidal explained uh, from the pathogenesis and, and Dr. Patnaik as well, basically this... Uh, glycosylization and, and everything related to uh, diabetes seem to affect the, the, the bulky tendons a lot more. So most diabetic foot 
deformities seem to present with whole heel cord contraction rather than isolated tightness of gastrocnemius. But if your clinical examination shows it is predominantly or exclusively tight gastrocnemius, uh, we feel that we should do only gastrox release, which, which is what we do. But in our uh, experience, that incidence is very, very low. I hope that answers the question. Can you elaborate some uh, some of medicine uh, medical products used like denosumab and teriparatide and also sometimes calcitonin? All these are being used now more and more. Denosumab has shown promising results. Have you used it? Our experience is uh, little, and probably you, you are aware. Uh, I'm sure you are aware. Uh, Prof. Nemal, that when you attended mm. our unit and subsequently, a number of these uh, trials were actually done at King's College Hospital as well. And some, in some of those trials, we we, um, uh, we actually we had to stop some of those trials. Uh, yeah, the medical uh, treatment is very promising, but it is not as uh, as as great as we had all previously expected. Okay. There is one perhaps, question. Um, uh, Dr. Um, Patnaik can elaborate on that, yes. Yes. <laughs> In fact, I skipped that point because there are trials with most of these bisphosphonates, that yes. from etidronate to alendronate, yes. pamidronate, and jolendronate, and most of these trials were done with pamidronate. There are, if you see uh, the meta-analysis, there are some, some benefit. But the benefit is not much to suggest. No, no we don't use them. Uh, we, so uh, and we, we, something calcitonin is of course not much help. Denosumab, the trials are very few. And the, you mentioned about parathyroid hormone. You know, basic problem in sarcots is osteoplast activation. So we have to tame the osteoplasts. Anti, we have to use anti-receptive medicines. Parathyroid hormone is not a good drug for this. So, and so I just have a, uh, want to have a cl clarification. How many of uh, these cases have peripheral arterial disease associated? Dr. Ben. Sir, there is also one question. Is there any role for surgery uh, in the diabetic code when they circuit stages? Maybe both can be answered by Benu. Oh, okay. Uh, vascular component, that's a very good question, Dr. Kailash. Uh, and again, it's interesting that um, the incidence of vascular, significant vascular compromise is constantly rising among people with Charcot uh, and uh, for people with diabetes as well. I think that reflects that these people are living longer. The people with, you know, uh, are, 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 you know, many people used to lose their limbs in the past, so vascular compromise was not in the equation. But, you know, many people are living longer. Many people are um, uh, living longer with charcoal as well. Now, the most recent uh, evidence shows the incidence of significant peripheral, peripheral vascular disease uh, during charcoal significant is 20%. From our, from our experience, from our series, 25% of them had a significant peripheral vascular disease that required uh, revascularization, either pr prior to or immediately after our reconstruction surgery. Uh, we we have done 157 shock of foot reconstructions. M many of them are referred from other centers. Many of them are, were recommended bologna amputation, but we haven't had a, a, a limb loss, even a single limb loss as yet, but it doesn't mean that it will never happen. But so far, we've been quite fortunate because all of these are thoroughly assessed by the vascular colleagues in the MDT, and if there is any significant far distal vascular compromise as well, they 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 are managed with uh, angioplasty or bypass or hybrid, predominantly angioplasty. You know they do angioplasty of um, uh, plantar arch um, uh, uh, in far distal as well. So that is that has been our experience. The incidence of peripheral vascular disease in advanced shock of foot presentations is very high. A uh, lot higher than what we thought. And the second question about uh, shock of foot reconstruction, surgical reconstruction. Yes, I mean, we, you know, Dr. Thiruvidula does a lot. Uh, we, we, we are doing a lot of these reconstructions. 
and uh, and I think you know in, in the in the coming uh, few years there will be overwhelming evidence in the literature that that is the gold standard, and because you know these people uh, are they live much longer because of the functional uh, limb salvage means they can weight bear in in shoes or in worst come scenario in braces, uh, and that prolongs their lifespan. And the quality of life is a lot better, uh, and the effect on cardiac, you know, rest of the renal and rest of the uh, organs is a lot better. So, and the the myth about the shock of shock of bones never heal or uh, have poor healing, that is gone now. You know, we have enough evidence. Uh, as I said, in, in in about five years' time, there will be massive evidence. Already, there's so much evidence. That is um, uh, my view. And 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 uh, Dr. Tiruvidala might want to add something as well. Um, my view with the uh, with the reconstruction is that when you when you see a patient and you have a deformity and you offer them you have a choice of an amputation or a reconstruction which can sometimes be a two or three surgery and can take up to six months to up to one year and often I haven't seen a single person so far who would say they would prefer to go for amputation they would say try whatever you can but save the foot. And we have instances where we've done more than two or three surgeries and things are not going as we expected. And when I say, I'm sorry, I can't think of anything else to do. Now is the time for amputation. They still say, fine, no, leave it alone. They, they're able to walk. They have a foot to look at. They can live with it. So the patient perception of reconstruction is changing. And the most satisfied people are diabetic people. As you can see, my, I do pediatrics and I do non-diabetic for an ankle and foot and ankle. Diabetic foot and ankle patients are most satisfied people. Even if you save the foot and they can stand, doesn't matter how, they, how the foot looks, they are the satisfied people. And that's the reason why we do all these complex reconstruction of the patients. Well, uh, Professor Kadas Mahapatra yeah. has the maximum experience of diabetic foot in our state. I request him to have his final comment and any other questions he wants to ask. Before we wind up, uh, we're already half an hour late. I'm extremely, you know, uh, delighted to have these two uh, beautiful, excellent presentations, very lucid presentations, self-explanatory by Professor Madhu and Professor Benu. And uh, this is coming in a big way, and this is the only game changer. You know, the surgical reconstruction yes. of Chaco Fort is going to be the, uh, in the light of the uh, next... Uh, and uh, from uh, this will bring a lot of hope uh, from despair. Uh, you know, people will not try to lose their limb. They will try to preserve, as uh, Professor Madhu said, though they, whatever uh, people are very much uh, excited and uh, to have their limb. And uh, whether it is a two-stage construction, reconstruction, or three-stage reconstruction, they want to have their limb at least. And that is, and uh, Professor Benu told about also, if you do an amputation, this uh, mortality, five-year mortality is more than 80%. Uh, so therefore, the lean salvage is the, uh, you know, uh, talk of the time. And in diabetic food, we should try, we should uh, do whatever possible way to preserve the lean. Uh, one question, uh, just I want to know, in UK, how much, if, what is the role of the stem cell therapy? You know, there are so many articles are coming. The mesenchymal stem cells in chocolate food uh, are promising giving good results. Is there any experience of Professor Benu and Professor Madhu? Okay, we we have done, uh, we have participated in a trial uh, about uh, 12 years ago uh, and that that showed absolutely no difference, so we discontinued. So it's, it's uh, a bit unfortunate that we keep seeing the same, uh, you know, the same, exactly the same product, the same thing keep coming back again and again. There is There is no evidence. You see, you know, the, it, this is predominantly a mechanical, uh, vascular-related uh, problem. It's not just from simple biological stimulation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. I want to add one, one small uh, uh, observation. Um, it's, it's also what Dr. Patnaik said, that we see quite a lot of patients with uh, diabetic-related neuropathy, but not uh, charcoal neuropathy. Now, that's very... <laughs> This is where I haven't proven it because in the UK, 
we see quite a lot of patients of wages races and I can say that the diabetic neuropathy or chocolate neuropathy is a disease of white race. Uh, of all the patients, if you see it, majority of patients are white, some are black. Extremely rarely we see an Asian patient coming with a chocolate midfoot deformity. Now, I don't know why, but that's why it is. So it's very uh, um, not surprising that you see very minimal uh, midfoot chocolate deformity compared to the rest of the peripheral neuropathy. So, but I don't know why this. Uh, Racial discrimination is there, but it is there. Okay, and before we end up, I'll request, uh, before I ask uh, Dr. Basan Behra, our secretary, to say a word of thanks, I'll ask uh, Sirsendo to say a few lines if he wants. Sirsendo, are you there? Okay, Basan, word of thanks. Okay, it is my pride, privilege, and honor. On my part, to give vote of thanks on behalf of Odisha Orthopedic Association to eminent speakers, Dr. Benu and Dr. Madhu. Really, we are thankful to you. You have given time for us and you have so enlightened us with the charcoal joint. Although it is a very rare subject, but it is not uncommon and we learn a lot. So, Dr. Benu, you are associated with the association long time. So, I hope we are having conference in the month of January 2002. And if you are visiting India, I invite you again to come and have a, some program with us. So I am thankful, <laughs> thankful to the panelists, both Mahapatra, sorry, panelists, Dr. Kalas, uh, panelists, Professor Bibi Misra, Professor um, Patnaik, and Professor Abani Misra for their beautiful discussion. I am thankful to our two Mahapatras, Dr. Nimal Chandra Mahapatra, my friend, and Professor Dr. Kalash Chandra Mahapatra for beautiful moderating the session. I must thank our President IOA, Dr. Siv Shankar and Dr. Nabin Thakkar, Secretary, for allowing us the IOTV to be telecast in IOTV and OTV, OrthoTV. And we are also thankful to Dr. Asok and Dr. Huda for allowing us to the program. I am also thankful to ASI Odisha chapter. Chairman Dr. Bikas, Chandra, Bikas Ranjan Huta and Dr. S.S. Sutar for associating with our association. And in the last but the not least, I am thankful to Dr. Swasat, our OGT team, who helped us in making this program success. I hope that our colleagues must have learned a lot from this discussion and not try to preserve the food without going for amputation, but it needs a lot of patience and dedication towards the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sissindo. Uh, I called you, but you were not there. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. So, when I am again inviting you. I, thank you. Yes, certainly. <laughs> if you are okay. visiting in the January, then please make a yes, point to I, attend the program. Uh, absolutely, yeah. certainly. If you are planning, yes. naturally you can come. That will be most pleasant time. You know. Because it is in Puri. <laughs> we are holding this conference in the Puri itself. Doc, thank you very much, Dr. Basanta. Definitely. Definitely will we'll plan. <laughs> and okay. you know, obviously, good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.